the health of the Queen is once again a subject of speculation among Britain's press. That's because it has been revealed Her Majesty spent Wednesday night in hospital after cancelling a visit to Northern Ireland. It had originally been reported she just needed some rest, and the delay in passing on that message might seem understandable. Perhaps a 95-year-old didn't want cameras chasing her to hospital. They waited a couple of days until they told the truth. The untruths, though, have really got under the skin of Nicholas Witchell. That's the BBC's royal correspondent. Let's take a look. It's quite difficult to read this. We were led to believe on Wednesday by Buckingham Palace that the Queen was resting at Windsor Castle. And as we were being told that by Buckingham Palace, and of course we were relaying that to our viewers and listeners and newspapers to their readers, in point of fact, she was uh, in hospital undergoing these what are now described as preliminary investigations. So we weren't given the complete picture then, the palace, and one can understand the palace's perspective on this. They would say that uh, uh, the Queen is entitled to patient confidentiality, to medical privacy and that sort of thing, notwithstanding that she is the head of state and that uh, millions of people in this country and around the world will be concerned. The problem, it seems to me, is that rumour and misinformation always thrives in the absence of proper, accurate and trustworthy information. Now, will we get f further information from Buckingham Palace today about her condition? I just don't know, but I think we need to recover a little bit from what happened on Wednesday. We are told that there were preliminary investigations taking place. Well, that would suggest that uh, after preliminary investigations, there may be some further subsequent investigations. We're told that she's in good spirits. That would certainly be in line with her stoical character. But that's a phrase, it's a little bit of a cliche now, this in good spirits. We're told that she's back at Windsor Castle undertaking light duty. Well, we must hope that we can place reliance on what the palace is telling us. We must hope we can depend on the reliance of what the palace is telling us. Um, it was quite a surreal intervention. Making it more odd was that he was wearing a black tie. And BBC hosts and, and presenters, they're, they're supposed to wear those black ties when the royals have died. So either that was, you know, somewhat threatening, you know, lie to me again and, and we'll see what can happen. Or it was him indicating that he's he's now got no trust in what they say, that the Queen could be dead and he doesn't know about it. So he's going to wear a black tie until he sees her in person because he does not trust anything that comes out of the palace anymore. Aaron, he seemed genuinely hurt, didn't he, as well as fuming. Yeah, it's quite funny, isn't it? I mean, for, for people who aren't British watching that, they, they might not grasp the gravity of what he's saying. For a BBC Royal Correspondent, talking those terms about Palisades is it's, it's basically like calling them the C word, they're saying they're useless, they should F off. You know, this is about as rude as it gets. I think the exact word he says was cliche. To say that they're offering cliches to the BBC Royal Correspondent when Her Majesty's, sorry, Her Royal Highness, Her Royal Highness's health is being questioned. I agree. And I think with the black suit, the black tie, very suspect, Michael. It's a bit like uh, criminology. We have a bit with politics in this country, but it's more so with the, with the royal household. Nobody has a clue what's going on in there. It's interesting. It's also, it's also incredibly mundane. Every time on the, because on the, I listen to The World at One on Radio 4 quite often and sometimes PM, and the thing that always shocks me is every time they say, we're going to now talk to our BBC correspondent, and every time it's a different person, I'm like, how many BBC, how many, sorry, royal yeah, correspondent, not BBC correspondent. How many royal correspondents can you possibly have as an organization? It's like they've got a whole team devoted to yeah. just, you know, conveying press releases from the palace to the public. Um, there was a, what a great job, though, Michael. What a great, I mean, can you imagine? Like, yeah, I would love it. Just do nothing, just sit on your ass all day. Just sit in London, go to Buckingham Palace down the road, you know, talk to a palace aide once a week. Um, I want to go to a quote from The Guardian. It was from a story about Laura Koonsberg moving on, but it was, I think, telling when it comes to how seriously the corporation takes covering the royals and the potential death of the Queen. Let's go to it. One BBC individual who is not moving jobs is Andrew Marr, who has been given a fresh contract to continue presenting his eponymous Sunday morning 
political interview show. Sources suggested part of the reason for this is his work producing BBC programmes that will be broadcast when the Queen dies. How to cover this inevitable and era-defining news story is increasingly playing a role in shaping the BBC's planning for the next few years. Coverage of the end of the monarch's life is due to be presented by the News at Ten host Hugh Edwards, although he recently suggested he was considering his future as host of the corporation's evening flagship show. So for this story, which, I mean, it will, it will clearly be a big news story, but I mean, it's not, it's not exactly surprising, is it? This 95-year-old is one day going to, you know, sadly pass away. And the BBC is not letting people retire or move on until she dies. So Andrew Marr has, has got his Sunday morning gig, even though, I mean, I think he's not a particularly good interviewer. He's, he's never very good at putting interviewees in an awkward situation in the way that someone like Andrew Neil is. I think they should probably try someone else. But apparently the reason he, he is remaining in that job is because he's made some, you know, prior documentaries about the Queen dying and they're going to keep him in that role until she goes. So if she lasts another 10 years, that's another 10 years of the Andrew Marr show. It, and Hugh Edwards, what if he wants to resign? He can't resign because he's, he's due to host a show when she pops her clogs. Uh, Aaron, it's kind of extraordinary, isn't it, that the national broadcaster who has what job is determined by them all not wanting to rock the boat until a 95-year-old passes away. Well, what a way to run a multi-billion pound organisation. <laughs> Can you imagine any other organisation that's, sorry, you're going, to be, you're going to be the chief of operations until this person dies. Could be 10 years. Sorry. I mean, you could be in your 70s. Sorry. You might get ill. You might have a terminal illness. <laughs> sorry. In a way, a more substantial story, because this is, of course, just speculation, um, is that Barbados got its first, uh, I think, elected president mm -hmm. um, in the last 48 hours. And Barbados is going to become a republic. Um, and I think what's an open secret really is that many of these countries in the West Indies are going to become republics. We have the Commonwealth still, and the, the Queen is still the head of state for a great many countries, and that will change, and it will accelerate once Queen Elizabeth II dies. And so that adds an extra gravity to the, the political nature of her, her passing when it happens. It's going to be a truly extraordinary event, Michael. In many ways, it will be the sunset on the British Empire. Um, because, of course, she ascended to the throne in the, in the 1950s. Britain was still very much an imperial power, still very much a world power. This was a country which developed you know, commercial nuclear energy before um, the United States, before China, had a satellite program, um, had nuclear weapons uh, before China, I believe. You know, It was a, a world power when she was the monarch. Um, was, of course, outside the European Union. You started the global sterling area. And of course, now in 2021, Britain is just a regular country in the North Atlantic, 65 million people, medium-sized economy, well, large economy, but you know, just a, a, a medium-sized power. It can do really impressive things, but only in collaboration with other countries. And she is kind of the avatar of that thing which is lost. And so when people say, oh, you know, there are no black people in British history, oh, this is ridiculous, it's always been a white country, it's like, well, Britain was an empire. Britain fundamentally was the British empire. It referred to this thing which covered, in the last century, a quarter of the planet's surface. And, and she's the last remnant of that. And so when she goes, institutions like the BBC, the military, uh, the British establishment are, are fundamentally going to have to re-examine who they are, what they're about, what this country is about. And of course, they don't want to do that. And so the act of mourning will be so inflated. And the reason why is because they want to extend this sort of political status quo further. It's going to be very difficult, though, as, as, the, as the example of Barbados shows. You know, many people had respect, both inside Britain but also beyond it, had respect for the institution of the monarchy because they had respect for the person of Queen Elizabeth II. And once she passes away, then that loyalty, that fidelity, that respect for the institution, all of a sudden that looks a lot more questionable.